Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us for this really um, exciting fireside. We're going to have a, a fun and inspiring evening tonight. Okay, our opening prayer will be offered by Brother Isaac Bat from the Woodsetton Ward. Dear Heavenly Father, we're thankful for all that we have and we're thankful for um, being able to be here together as a big body of youth to um, um, enjoy each other's company and to enjoy being one with our faith and with Heavenly Father. And please bless that we'll all enjoy, enjoy the fireside and we'll feel the spirit. And we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, some thank yous to Coventry Stake for um, giving us your account. It's very kind of you. And Brother Plumley and Brother Piper for doing all the technical stuff that goes straight over my head. Thank you very much. Um, after Brother Hanks, we're going to have a Q&A. We've got um, some of your mentors and single adults to do that. We have Zach Grice from Litchfield Stake and Laura Slater from Coventry Stake. And then we'll have closing remarks from Brother Piper. So I'm going to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Henry Hank Smith, PhD. Dr. Hank grew up surrounded by Red Cliffs in St. George, Utah. He earned a master's degree from Utah State University and a PhD from BYU, where he works now as an assistant professor. In addition to his work in consulting companies and school districts, Dr. Hank speaks for school assemblies around the US. Dr. Hank has also authored many books and talks on CDs and digital media with Covenant Communications. Dr. Hank and his wife, Sarah, good name, um, currently live in Mapleton, Utah, where they love to hike and camp. Dr. Hank says that Sarah's a miracle who knows everything about me and still loves me. They have five incredibly adorable children who get their looks from their mother. Hank Smith enjoys the Utah jazz. jazz. He really, really enjoys the Utah jazz. Um, immediate connection for you basketball fans. He also runs marathons and enjoys eating out, which is why he runs his marathons. Um, I need to start marathoning, I think. Okay, so I will hand over to our guest speaker. Have a great time, everybody. Here is Brother Hank Smith. Oh, how exciting. This is the best. I am so excited. Let me look around uh, and meet you. There's Gabby. Hi, Gabby. Uh, and Laura and uh, Zach and Lauren. I love, if you can turn your videos on, that would be great. If I know some people are like, no, I don't want to be on video, but it's so nice to be able to see people, even if they're far away sitting on a very nice couch. Right, Marissa? Uh, let's see. Um, oh, and we have a lot of sisters and elders. Wonderful. Jake and Eli. Hello, Jake and Eli. Uh, and the Piper kids. Hello, Piper kids. You look like Pipers. Uh, I do, that is a beautiful name that I do not know how to say. Adiogans. Did I say it right? They just smile. They just smile. They're like, yeah, yeah, well, close enough. Close enough. Sister Powell and Jesse and Kirst, is it Kirsty? Hi, Kirsty and Robert and uh, Wendy Barnes. And it looks like someone's next to Wendy Barnes. Uh, and Scott Meldrum and Naomi. Uh, who and Naomi's with someone else. I'm just Naomi's brother, I'm assuming. Is that Naomi's brother or boyfriend? One or the other. All right. Uh, let's see. Oh, Sarah's here. More missionaries. The bull, the Balak. Is it Balak? Hi, you guys. Oh, this is so exciting. I am loving this. I am loving this. Now, what time is it, Sarah, in uh, where you are? It has just gone half past seven. Half past seven. All right. And what time is it where I am? I don't even know. Uh, it is 1230. Uh, so uh, you guys, I am just so excited to be here. I bet most of you have no idea who I am. And that is totally okay with me. I, I want to make friends with you. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, my name is Hank Smith. Hank is more of a dog name than a people name, but that's okay. I've gotten past it. Um, my parents did it to me, but um, the medication helped. Um, I, uh, growing up, growing up, my, uh, the bane of my existence was a book called Hank the Cow Dog. And everyone, whenever they hear my name, they're like, just like that book, Hank the Cow Dog. Uh, and I found out later on that Hank is a cow dog who thinks he's in charge, but he's really not. 
Uh, so it really does fit my life really well. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. I have done all, quite a few of these Zoom firesides. Uh, so I am going to share my screen with you, but I am going to be able to see you. Okay, so as I share my screen with you, I want to get to know you a little bit. Now, I know you can see me and the screen, but remember, I can see you. So you're going to have to smile. Uh, and if you think something's funny, Gabby, you need to laugh. Uh, and you need to, you know, this isn't a movie. I can see you. All right. So I want to be able to just interact with you as I show you some some pictures here. So let's go back. Uh, that is my beautiful bride, Sarah. She is absolutely wonderful. I adore her. Um, it's this short of idolatry. I really, really like this girl. Uh, I just think she's a fantastic. All right. Now, uh, we had our, a couple of years after we got married, we had our oldest child. Let me show you her. There she is. Okay. That's our oldest. Uh, she's not that big anymore. She's a lot bigger, but um, she, uh, let me raise your hand if you're the oldest child in your family. Raise your hand if you're the oldest child in your family. All right. looks like Jake is the oldest. Um, someone with Megan and Sam looks like Megan and Sam's mom is the oldest maybe okay oh yeah i got that right uh who else is the oldest jesse's the oldest good good um the oh adiegan's girl is the oldest is the oldest i didn't get sonia's the oldest all right one of the howlets is the oldest okay okay so i have noticed something my friends the life of the oldest child is completely different than the life of the youngest child the oldest child goes to the doctor more than all the other children combined. Why? Because you only have one and you, every time it falls down, you think you broke it. Uh, so you take it to the doctor and the doctor's like, nope, it's okay. And so you take it home. Uh, by the last child, those of you who are parents, you figure out these little humans are pretty durable. Uh, and, uh, you know, our youngest child, a boy, I don't know if he's ever been to the doctor. Uh, I don't know if he's ever, he's ever met one. Um, he, uh, I hate to tell you this, but the other day he fell down the stairs and neither my wife or I even moved. Um, I mean, we, we kind of leaned in a little bit listening for him and he went, ah, we're like, he's conscious. He's fine. Um, so Maddie is 16 now. Um, how many of you are 16? Let me see if I have any 16 year olds in the group. 16 year olds. Do I have not a single 16 year old? Let me look through. Oh, okay. One of the Pipers is 16. All right. None of the missionaries is 16. That's probably good. Uh, let's see. Okay. A couple other 16 year olds, maybe. Oh yeah. So Maddie is 16. She's, she's a good kid. You guys, she's just like you. She's doing her best. Uh, she reads her scriptures. Um, she says her prayers. She went on a date last night, which is pretty funny. Uh, you know, some kids showed up and he tried to be all, you know, like appropriate. He's like, hello, brother Smith. And I was like, hurt her and I'll kill you. So, um, the other day we were at the store. Well, I guess it was before the whole world shut down. So I guess it wasn't the other day, but a couple months ago we were at the store and um, she, she wanted me to buy something for her and she had her own money. So I'm like, well, buy it yourself. And she said, no, I want to use your money. How many of you like using your parents' money more than your money? Anybody, anybody like using their parents' money, right? She's like, yeah, I want to use your money. And I'm like, no, use your own money. I'm not buying that for you. Your money you got from me anyway, right? So use your own money. And she was mad at me. So she stopped talking to me for a while, which I was okay with. And then she texted me, you guys, she was standing right next to me. And she, I got a text from her. <laughs> so I'm like, what? I mean, she's right next to me, not like feet away from me. She is right next to me. And I looked down at my phone and all it says is dad is driving me crazy. And it had all those red faced emojis with the swear words over the mouth. You guys know what I'm talking about? Those red ones, uh, really angry ones. And I looked at my phone and I said, who are you texting? And she said, mom. And I was like, oh. And so I put my phone away and not three seconds later, I hear her say, shoot, right? <laughs> Have you ever texted the wrong person, the wrong thing? Who's ever done that before? You've texted the wrong person. You're like, no, 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 no. Send that back, send that back. No, I didn't mean to do that. All right. So that's Maddie. She's pretty great. Okay. Oh, yeah. For we had a second child for a long time. We didn't know if he had a neck. Uh, he is a very large baby. Um, he, this is the day he is 
born. That is his three-year-old sister holding a brand new baby, and he is over half her weight. Uh, and this is the next day right here. Just kidding. It wasn't the next day. It was a couple of days later. But um, So uh, he, this is child number two. Raise your hand if you're the second child in the family. Second child in the family. All right. So it looks like Sam is the second child. Sister Bunt's second child. Zach, you're a second child. All right. Eli is child number two. Ooh, we have lots of child number two at the Cope family. Wow. It's just two, two, two. All of you guys they had the second child children hanging out together. Oh, no. Uh, the Adiagons uh, are child number two. Uh, just type in your first names. Go to rename and type in your first name so I can. So I can. I want to get it right. I'm, I'm so sad about this. All right. Uh, none of the missionaries are child number two. Interesting. Uh, they apparently child number two. Oh, we do. Uh, one of the Canuck missionaries is child number two. All right. So um, how many of you, child number two, I guess all of you can raise your hand on this. How many of you feel like you are compared to a sibling? Like sometimes your parents compare you to one of your siblings and you don't feel... All right. Okay. Lots of people with their hand up on this. They feel kind of compared. Eli's like, I can't be like Jake. Jake's amazing. I can't be Jake. Right, Eli? It's not fair. It's not fair. Yeah. Push Jake. That's good. Good. That, that's a good part of the fireside is we're going to have a little violence here. Jesse, right? Being compared to someone. <clears throat> so the other day, Maddie read the Book of Mormon like 72 times in a day. And I said, um, I asked her brother, Mason, this is Mason. I said, are you going to read? And he said, I read subtitles of movies. That's what he reads, subtitles of movies. And I said, um, he said, stop comparing me to Madeline. And I said, I'm not comparing you. I was just wondering. And he said, no, you're comparing me to Madeline and it's not fair. So I had to teach him a lesson. You guys, I said, I said, you have got to stop complaining. Madeline's a pretty great sister, but she is not perfect. Okay, and then I taught him this. This is true. Did you guys know that Jesus, 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 had a little brother named James? Did you know that? Okay, how would you like to be James? <clears throat> Can you imagine the pressure? Everyone's like, why can't you be more like Jesus, James? He's like, I'm trying to. I bet James wrote that song we sing in primary. I'm trying to be like Jesus. I bet James wrote that because everybody's like, why can't you be more like Jesus, James? Can you imagine the pressure when he walks into school and they're like, you're Jesus's little brother? <laughs> like, yeah, what can you do? Oh man, uh, right? Can you imagine how many times he ran out on the Sea of Galilee and just sank? It would just be rough to be James. So the next time you feel compared to your sibling, just remember you don't have to be James. All right, this is our uh, third child right here. He never looked like this. He mostly looked like this. Uh, he just, you know, kind of a sad baby. This is like two seconds of his life. This is the rest of his life. Uh, just kind of, just sad. Uh, he's my little redheaded baby. All right, so child number three, raise your hand. Child number three, I want to see you. Marissa's child number three. Oh, sister, okay, Sarah's number three. Spencer's, no, sister, brother Piper's number three. All right, Gabby, your child three. I was waiting for Gabby to raise a hand there. Let's see. Oh, the other canic. Okay. Uh, I haven't seen the rugby sisters raise their hands. I don't know if they're paying attention. Um, let's see. Oh, Katie's child number three. Here's to your child number three. All right. So child number three, keep your hand up. I guess everybody can keep their hand up here. Um, how many of you have ever been called the wrong name by your parents? You've been called the wrong name by your own parents. This is terrible. This is, yeah. How many of you have parents that go down a list? They just name names and you're like, nope, nope, nope. That's the dog. Nope, nope, nope. Right. You're just kind of waiting for your name. All right. Uh, it's, it's tough. Oh, okay. I got new names here. Uh, uh, Leia. Why is your name so hard? Noah, I know. Noah, I know. But we're going to call you Allie. Hi, Allie. All right. <laughs> She's like close enough. <laughs> okay. So child number three, I feel bad for you. Um, Child number, being child number three is hard, but he is also my most, he's downstairs, so I have to be quiet. He is my most difficult child by far. He is 20% of my children and 95% of my problems. He is really hard, you guys. Okay, um, how many of you um, would describe yourself as maybe the most difficult child? If your family's putting your hand up, you might as well just put your hand up. If there's a fight, you're probably in it. 
If there's a mess, you probably had something to do with it. All right, I wanna see who's the most difficult child. Noah, are you the most difficult child? Noah's like, no, I am not a difficult child. I am perfect. All right, okay, okay. All right, I'm not seeing very many hands. Good, good. You guys are not the most difficult. Laura, no, you're the most difficult child. Laura, I never would have guessed. Laura, Sarah, do you have your hand up as the most difficult child? Sarah, what? Okay, so um, he is the only child that's thrown a full plate of food at me. I, a, a full plate of food with the plate, you guys, with the plate. I was cutting the, everybody's food and all the children, all the normal children ate it. Uh, and he slid it back to me and I said, what's your problem? And he said, you cut it. And I was like, well, okay. Um, yeah, I was being nice. And I looked at my wife and she said, he doesn't like his food cut now. Do any of you have siblings that make up new rules for no reason whatsoever? They just make up new things that they like and you didn't know it. So I like looking at him and I said, well, I can't weld it back together at this point. So sorry. Uh, and I, you know, I slid it back to him and he slid it back to me. And I was like, no, 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 no. You do not disrespect the dad at the dinner table. There is no, I had to use my dad voice. Does your dad have a dad voice? Does anybody here have a dad with a dad voice? I had to use my dad voice. Anybody here with a mom with a dad voice? Any of you have a mom with a dad voice? Yep. I had to use my dad voice. So I said, Elijah, I had to get deeper, right? Use their full name. Anybody get called their full name by their parents ever? And you know, you're in trouble. They did not forget your name this time. They called you every syllable, right? So I slid it to him and I said, this will stay right in front of you. Whether you eat it or not is your problem, but it will stay right there. Do you understand? And his siblings are saying, say you understand. So you understand, right? Do any of you have a sibling that pushes it too far and you're like, you're going to get us all killed? Do any of you have one of those where you're like, you're going to get us killed? You, you've got to know your boundaries. Parents are going to freak out, right? Zach, you're pointing at her, right? Both of you are pointing at her. She's got to know the boundaries. So um, he looks at them and he looks at me and he's like, I understand. And I said, good. And I sat down and I looked at my wife like, that's all you have to do. You just have to really throw down the law and boo, you guys, the whole plate of food hits me in the face. The whole thing is all of his siblings at the table went, oh. have you ever had one of those moments where you're like, you're dead. You are dead. You are so dead. I'm going to watch you die. And, and then you thought, if you laugh, you're going to die too, huh? So you just are like, think of something sad. Think of something sad. So I am, you guys, I am, I am looking at him and he's looking at me and I get up to go around the table and my wife's like, stop, you'll go to prison. I was like, I don't care. Oh, you guys, he, I love him. I do. I love him when he is asleep. Um, he is so perfect, but when he's awake, sometimes I'm like, how did you get a body? All right. So we always wanted to have we always wanted to have four kids. How many kids do you want to have? Let me see by your fingers. How many kids do you want to have? If you're going to have kids. Okay, there's four. Laura, four. Okay, how many kids are you going to have? Future family. All right, some sisters. We've got some five and threes. Oh, ten. The here for sisters. Okay, wow, ten children. And the oh, Isaac Whitney. Is that you, Isaac Whitney? You want to have ten kids too? We'll, we'll uh, line you up with one of the Hereford sisters after... Uh, after a mission. All right. Um, let's see. Um, who else wants to have kids? Let me see. I, don't put your hands down yet. I wasn't able to see everybody. Okay. Rugby sisters. There's four. The other rugby sisters are not going to have any kids. She's like, nope, I don't want to have kids. All right. Uh, let's see. Jesse, four kids. You want to have four kids? Caitlin, five, five kids. Uh, that's not Scott Meldrum. That's Sister Meldrum. And she wants to have five. So lots of people with five kids here. Okay, good, good, good. So um, we wanted to have four kids. And we had a girl and a boy and a boy. Guess what we wanted at the end? Just guess, Laura. We wanted to have a girl because everyone knows girls are perfect. Girl, boy, boy, girl. So we wanted to have four kids. How perfect would this be, right? Very symmetrical. So we went to the doctor to see our baby girl. Guess what we got? Two more boys. I am not joking. We got two more boys. This is completely unfair. This was a big joke, right? I, I was like, what? Are you kidding me? Two more boys. I remember telling my daughter and I, she said, is this a girl? And we're like, nope. And she said, it's another boy, well, sort of. Uh, she said, what do you mean? I said, it's two more boys. She started to cry. She's like, we already have two boys. <laughs> I said, I know. She's like, she said, why would God do this to me? I was like, to you, what about me, right? 
two more boys. I'm not kidding. Here's another one of them. Watch that one on the right. His face doesn't change. Watch really closely. Is that weird? I, I was asking the doctors. I was like, what's wrong with that one? See that one on the right? Like, and they said, we don't know. Take it home. So we, we took it home, you guys. And eight months later, his face had not changed. It's the exact same face. I, it's weird, Gabby. It's weird. Gabby's like, what is wrong with that kid? He's kind of scaring me. In fact, one day my wife said, I know who he is. I said, who? She's like, he looks like Megamind. He looks just like Megamind, right? Almost, almost the exact uh, right? A little blue food coloring and he's the exact kid. All right. If you're baby four or five, put your hand up. Put your hand up for four if you're four and then put your hand up for five. So put a four or a five up so I can see who's baby four and who's baby five. All right. The bat family has a baby five. All right. All right. Sister Piper is baby four. The Griffiths have a baby something there. She just put her hand he just put her hand i can't see it's far away uh okay oh sister cope i thought you were a baby two and now you're baby five you're she's baby two. Oh, okay oh four oh, i got it yeah i got it i got it i got it all right oh some of the elders baby five. Oh, both sisters are baby five. Oh, we have four and swan c swan c sisters put those hands up higher you're got them in front of your face can't see four and four are you both four are you both baby four? Oh, that's so cute. Look at you. All right, companions. Oh, oh, another. Oh, you guys are elders. The one who wanted to have 10 kids. Elder. Oh, okay. So we could, oh, that'd be perfect with that other missionary from Hereford. All right. Um, let's see. Um, well, the missionaries are loving the lining up I'm doing. I just, every time I line them up. Don't worry, they only date on P-Day. All right, uh, Sister Meldrum is baby five. One of the ba a Balak, I think, is baby four or five. Okay, um, okay. I don't know if this works this way in your guys' house, but keep your hand up if you feel like there's less pictures of you than the other children, right? Let me see. Gabby, there's less pictures of you than the other kids. It's almost around baby four where parents just stop taking pictures. I don't know. I, I think we have our hands full. Uh, and we're like, I just can't take a picture, right? We're on vacation. I'm trying to control everyone and I can't take a picture anymore. Sometimes we'll go on vacation. I don't take a single picture because, you know, I, I was holding someone or something the entire time. All right. So you guys, oh, I got to keep going. Hold your hand up if we didn't cover, because I only have five kids. So do you have a, if you're baby six, put your hand up seven, baby eight, baby nine. Let me see what number you are. Baby 10. Do I have a, any baby 10s? Okay, I'm looking for hands. So, is anybody still with their hands up? Oh, there's a cute baby. Look at the Bollock baby. Oh, hi, Bollock baby. That's so cute. Okay, uh, King, your baby what? Six? Seven? Looks like she's got seven up there. Baby seven. Whoa, Brother Meldrum, your baby number eight? Whoa, baby number eight. We're going to keep going here. Okay. So you guys, I did this the other day with a group and this kid kept doing this. Look at me. He goes like this. He was like this. And I was like, you're number seven of 10? And he goes, no, no. And I was like, wait, wait, wait. You're baby 17? And he goes, yeah. Okay. I was, I was like, um, I go, I thought maybe it was a blended family. Like mom had kids, dad had kids, and then they got married, right? No, it wasn't. It wasn't. You guys, his mom had 17 children and she didn't even have twins. She had 17 individual births. She was pregnant for 13 years. Um, I, she, it was, I, I, I said, what's it like being in a, in a family? He has 19 people in his family, just his parents and his siblings, 19 people. And I said, what's it like? And he said, you have a lot of birthday cake, <laughs> which made me laugh. He's like, we have a lot of birthday parties, like two a month. Uh, and then he said, um, uh, I said, is it weird being in a family of 17? Like, what's it like? And he said, he said, he started laughing. And he said, one time he got his hair cut, like really bad. He, it was summertime. It got really hot. So he decided just to cut all of his hair off. And he didn't really tell anyone and he got home and he came to dinner and he sat at dinner and he said his dad just kind of looked at him like this, like, 
And then he looked at his brother who he was sitting next to and he said, hey, who's your friend? He didn't forget his name. He didn't recognize his own child. <laughs> he didn't recognize him because he cut his hair. So the next time your parents forget your name, just be like, well, at least you know who I am. All right. Now, um, let me show you all of us. Go the, there's all of us together. There's all seven of us together. And the reason I'm telling you this is one, I wanted to get to know you a little bit. And two, I wanted to tell you something that one of my heroes said. Her name is Julie Beck. Have you ever heard that name before? Julie Beck. Julie B. Beck was the Relief Society president of the church one time uh, a couple of years ago. And she said something very simple, but I remembered it from the moment she said it until today. She said, if it is anti-family, it is anti-Christ. And I had never thought of that before, that if something was anti-family, it would be anti-Christ. I just figured if something was anti-Christ, I would know it because someone would have like, you know, horns coming out of their skin and green eyes. And they're like, I'm anti-Christ, right? I'd be like, okay, that's the anti-Christ. That was easy. But uh, I think the adversary is more subtle. If it is anti-family, it is anti-Christ. Um, now, how many of you uh, youth that are listening and missionaries, I guess. Uh, how many of you plan on having your own family one day? You want, you really want to have your own family one day, your own, your own little cr group of crazy people. If your hand is up, if your hand is up, Noah, put your hand up. If your hand is up, you believe in God. You are on his side. You look at, because you are not anti-family. You are very pro-family and you want to keep going family. As the world is becoming more and more anti-family, you are still steady saying, nope, I want to have my own family one day. So if it is anti-family, it is anti-Christ. And I'll tell you this, these, do you see, if you saw this on online, you'd be like, oh, what a happy family. And we are a happy family. Although look at that redhead over on my shoulder. Do you see him? He's smiling because he's plotting our deaths. All right. Uh, he, he, he's like, they're all dead soon. Okay. So. Um, I, I'll just say this. This is by far the best part of my life. If you have your parents close to you right now, will you ask them what the best part of their life is? Say, what's the best part of your life? If you have your parents close to you right now, just turn to them and ask, what's the best part of your life? I promise you, if they're being serious, they're not going to say my job. All right. They're not going to say my job. They're not going to say my calling, even though they probably like their job and they probably like their calling, right? What's the best part of their life by far? You are, which is weird because they ground you sometimes, right? But you are the best part of their life. It's not even close, right? It's not even close, right? Uh, I don't see a last name here, right, Matthew? Best part of your life sitting right next to you. By far, best part of your life right there, uh, which is fascinating because, you know, these are the same people that drive us crazy, but they are the best part of our lives. And I don't want you to miss out on that. So who is going to have their own family one day? Let me see one more time. Who's going to have their own family one day? Yes, yes. Because remember what Sister Beck said, finish this statement to the person next to you. If it is anti-family, it is what, Laura? It is anti-Christ. Very good. If it is anti-family, it is anti-Christ. Okay. Uh, I have a, a, just a short message for you today past this. Um, this. I was doing my family history work the other day, and I ran into my great-great-grandfather. I know. I was like, wow. Okay. Oh, uh, if I saw a great grandpa uh, on the street, I would run away from him. I really would because uh, some sort of accident, his face melted off, right? I would be like, no. Uh, Gabby, would this guy scare you? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I'd be like, um, especially if I saw him and he like, was like, that's my grandson. Right? I'd be like, oh, run away. I'd be terrified to see this guy. Well, as I'm looking at this, my wife came by. And she said, that's got to be your great grandfather. You look just exactly, I was like, no, nah, 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 very funny. And then she said, no, 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 it's not that hard. If you just change your perspective a little bit, it's not as scary as you think. If you just change your perspective a little bit, it's not as scary as you think. What is that? What is that? I love to see everybody's heads turn. You guys should see all 40 heads turn at the exact same time. What is it? Laura, what? Oh, Laura, can you see what it is? You don't have to tell us, but you can you see what it is? Don't, don't tell us yet because other people are like, yeah, I see it. No, I don't see it. I don't see it. Sarah, you see it? Okay, Zach? 
You see it, right? And some of you are like, I don't see it. I don't know what it is. Do you see the little puppy? Who sees the little puppy? Curled up there with his nose against his tail, right? I'm, I'm watching Gabby's face for it. To, oh, she finally saw it. Like it lit up. She's like, there it is, cute little puppy. Okay. So what I saw as something scary, something to avoid, what did my wife see? She saw something not to avoid, something to be like, oh, that's so cute. Now, I've noticed that some people will are afraid of trials and difficulties. Who here is, is, tries to avoid trials and difficulties as much as possible? Who tries to avoid trials? So do I. How many of you, let's be totally honest here, how many of you have ever tried to make a deal with God about what trials you're willing to go through and what trials you're not willing to go through? right? You're like, this, this, and this would be okay. This, this, and this is out of bounds. I'm switching teams, right? Okay. 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 I get it. I get it. Um, but some people, there are some people out there who see trials as something not to avoid. Is that crazy? Right? One of those names, have you ever heard the name Spencer W. Kimball? Have you ever heard that name before? Listen to this. He said, when I think about trials and difficulties, he says, I tell the Lord, give me this mountain. What? Who in the world would be like, yes, give me that trial. I wouldn't, Laura, I'm with you. I'd be like, no, I'll go around that mountain, right? Uh, fly me over that mountain, Lord. I'd be okay with that. So I see something to avoid. Me and Laura are, you know, we see something to avoid. Uh, and yet there are people who are like, no, I'm okay with trials. I'm okay with difficulties. How do we get to that point where we're not so afraid of them, uh, but you know, we see them, we see them differently. Well, so that's what I want to help with today. So uh, I don't know if this is an actual photograph of Jesus walking on water or if it's just a painting. I'm not sure. Um, but there's this story, you, I'm sure you've heard it before, of Jesus walking on water, right? Uh, I want to show you something in Mark chapter 6. Um, it says that he told his disciples to get into a ship, and he's going to stay in verse 46. Uh, he, on the, he's going to stay over in the mountain. To, he's going to say a prayer. He's going to go pray over there. Okay, now do you see verse 47? It says, when even was come. Even in the Holy Land. I teach the four gospels at this little school in Provo called BYU. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but I teach in the religion department at BYU. And um, we study this. Uh, uh, this is what I do for a living is I teach these four gospels. Well, verse 47, that word even is 6 p.m. So when 6 p.m. comes, so you can picture the sun is going down, um, he is on the land and they are on the sea. Verse 48, he sees them toiling. Do you see that word in there? Toiling in rowing. He sees them toiling and rowing. So they're like stressing out. Uh, they're working hard and it's 6 p.m. And apparently he sees them and he's like, oh, they're working hard out there. They're really struggling. Gabby, bless you, bless you, bless you. That was so cute. I've never seen someone sneeze on Zoom before. All right, so um, he sees them out there struggling, you guys, and apparently he doesn't go out for quite a while because look, look at verse 48. Everyone with me on verse 48? About the fourth watch of the night, he comes to them. So at 6 p.m., the Jewish day goes from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. At 6 p.m., that starts the night, which is, you, it goes by watches. 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. is the first watch. 9 p.m. to midnight is the second watch. Midnight to 3 a.m. is the third watch. And guess when the fourth watch is? 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. That's the fourth watch. So how long have they been out there when he starts walking on the sea? Over nine hours. When's the last time you went to the gym and you saw the rowing machine? You're like, I'm going to put in a solid nine hours here on the rowing machine. Holy cow. If you're rowing a boat for nine hours, how are you feeling after nine hours? You're exhausted. You're scared. You're, uh, you're, you know, you think you're probably going to die. You know, these guys spend time on the water. This is Peter and Andrew, James and John. They've spent time on the water. So they are, this has got to be a terrifying night for them. And then after that long of a night, he starts walking on the sea. Now look what it says next. It says that they saw him and they think he's a spirit and they cried out. So they're scared. And, and I can imagine why. Some of you are like, well, why would they be scared? Everybody knows Jesus walks on water. Yeah, we all know that, but they didn't have a copy of the book, right? Um, they're not like, let's see what happens to us next. No, they, this is all new stuff to them, right? So they're watching this happen. 
and uh, he comes out and they're like, oh no, they probably think the Grim Reaper is coming, right? He's going to come collect their soul or, uh, right, somebody, this is some evil spirit that's going to come get them. And they're really scared. Can you imagine, um, let's say that you are uh, on the boat and with every flash of lightning, there's this figure out there and you can see it. And with every flash of lightning, it's, it gets closer and closer and closer, right? You're like, whoa. Now here's my favorite word. It says they all saw him in verse 50 and were troubled. I love that. I love that they're just troubled, right? here's this spirit coming at them and they're really scared. And one leans over to the other and says, I am troubled. <laughs> you think, all right. The next time you're really scared, like if you're in a haunted house or something with your friends and you're really scared and it's quiet, just lean over to your friend and go, I am troubled. <laughs> and see if they're like, what are you talking about? You're like, sorry, I read the Bible a lot. All right. So, um, they all saw him and were troubled. Now, here's what I want you to see. Uh, I want you to write this one down. If you got your phone or a little notepad or something, it says, immediately he talked with them. And look what he says. Four words. Be of good cheer. He doesn't say, like, it's okay. He says, hey, cheer up. Smile. Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. Now, I have to tell you something, you guys. Um, how many of you have been troubled in the last three and a half, four months? Anybody here been troubled? Anybody a little stressed, a little working hard? A little, uh, this is a little scary, a little scary, right? Been a little troubled? Now, if we were to relate this story to us, we might be out here for a long time struggling. Jesus comes out to us, and if we're quiet enough, we can hear him say something like that, something like, be of good cheer. It is I. I think sometimes we forget that this whole virus is not news to the Lord. <laughs> he wasn't sitting in heaven in some celestial break room uh, when an angel came running in saying, Lord, there's a huge problem. What? There's a virus on the earth. He spits out his hot, heavenly hot chocolate. <laughs> what? Right. And then I did not see this coming. Battle stations. No. Right. He, the, he's, he knew this was coming. He knew this was coming when he called you on a mission. He knew this was coming last year. He knew this was coming two years ago, 10 years ago. He knew this was coming on the earth at this time. He knew that. So if we're pretty quiet, we can hear him say what? Be of good cheer. It's I. Don't be afraid, right? Don't be afraid. Now, I want to show you something Elder Holland said about. He said, such counsel is not a jaunty pep talk about the power of positive thinking. So um, I don't want you to be confused. When the Savior says, be of good cheer, he doesn't mean like, hey, you're going to drown, but smile on your way down. All right, no, it's not, it's not a pep talk, right? It's, he says, it's not a jaunty pep talk about being a positive thinker. Although that's fine. Being a positive thinker is fine. He says, no, Christ knows better than all others that the trials of life can be very deep. And look at this. We are not shallow people if we struggle with them. How many of you have struggled in the last three and a half, four months? Anybody struggled at all in the last three and a half, four months? Guess what that does not mean? It does not mean you have a weak testimony. It does not mean you don't have a close relationship with God. It does not mean that you are spiritually not there. When you are struggling, it's evidence that you are what scientists call alive. All right? It's, struggling is part of life. Let me be very clear on this. Your testimony is not supposed to make it so you don't struggle. That's not the point. We're not supposed to go, I don't know why I'm struggling. I felt like I had a testimony. No, that's not, that's not what this is about. Having a testimony helps us through our struggles. It helps us understand our struggles, but it's never supposed to make us immune to struggling. Laura, are you with me? It's not supposed to make us immune to struggling. He says, we are not shallow people if we struggle, but... Even as the Lord avoids sugary rhetoric. Sugary rhetoric is just another term for pep talk. Can you tell Elder Holland has a PhD from Yale? But even as the Lord avoids sugary rhetoric. Now, this is three words I want you to hear. He deplores pessimism. He deplores pessimism. Do you know what um, deplores means? Well, first of all, do you know what pessimism is? 
pessimism. Okay, what's the difference? If you're like Brother Smith, what's the difference between struggling and pessimism? All right, here's struggling. Struggling is, Lord, I'm having a very hard day. I'm having a very hard week. Okay, pessimism is, Lord, I'm having a very hard day. And every day I've ever had has been hard. And I bet every day I'm ever going to have has been hard. I might as well die by litter because I'm going to die alone with cats, right? I hate my life. That's the difference between struggling and pessimism. As a missionary, struggling is, Lord, this is really hard for me. Pessimism is, Lord, this is really hard for me. I don't even know why I came on a mission in the first place, right? I, I bet I'm just going to go home and nothing's going to have changed and I, I'm worse off for this. So I, you obviously don't know what you're doing. Do you see the difference between struggling and pessimism? Struggling, it's okay. Pessimism, now do you know the word deplores? you know what deplores means? Okay, Gabby, if you don't know what deplores means, listen to this. Let's say you see me cleaning a dumpster, a garbage, rubbish. All right, I'm cleaning a uh, uh, rubbish. Okay, and and uh, I need to come to England. I, I just need to. Who who thinks I should come there and live there forever? Because that's where I need to live. I, I I would I would love that so much. All right, so someone find me a job. Okay, I can say rubbish. All right, so that's my one skill that would be valuable. So um, and I cannot get the I cannot get Matthew to smile. I am trying so desperate. There we go. Oh, okay. There we go. So, um, Gabby, picture me cleaning cleaning a garbage, a rubbish bin, and there's some gunk in there, like jellyish gunk in there that's been in there a long time. Okay, and you watch me, and you're like, "What's he doing?" And I, I'm super hungry, and so I kind of smell it with my hand, and then I just go, oh, right. I just eat it. All right. Oh, good, good, Gabby. That face right there. That face you just did, that's deplores. All right. That's deplores. So this is going to sound weird, but I'm going to say it anyway. If you want to make Jesus throw up in his mouth a little, what should you do? Be, be pessimistic. He, he deplores pessimism. So when we go, Lord, I'm having a bad day and every day I've ever had is going to be hard. And I'm all, all I'm going to have is hard days for the rest of my life. I don't even know why I'm alive. The Lord's like, whoa, right? Uh, he deplores pessimism. It's okay if we struggle. It's totally okay to struggle. Let me say that again. It is totally okay to struggle. Pessimism is not okay. Well, why not? Well, the Lord expects us to believe. Look what he says next. He quotes another apostle. He said, I love what Elder Orson F. Whitney once said. The spirit of the gospel, you might want to write this one down or take a picture of it. The spirit of the gospel is optimistic. That's the whole point of having it. The spirit of the gospel is optimistic. It trusts in God. It's, we're supposed to look on the bright side of things. How many of you have someone in your house who looks on the bright side of things? Any of you have someone who lives with you who looks on the bright side of things? Okay. Listen to this next part. This is the whole point of the quote. We should honor the Savior's declaration to be of good cheer. Indeed, it seems to me we may be more guilty of breaking that commandment than almost any other. My friends, be of good cheer is not a pep talk. What is it? It's a commandment. It is the 11th commandment, thou shalt be of good cheer. Show me on your face what be of good cheer looks like. Show the people you're sitting next to what be of good cheer looks like on your face. Gabby, that's so cute. Be of good cheer. What does that look like on your face? Jake, show Eli what be of good cheer looks like on your face. Brother Stobbs, I want to see what be of good cheer looks like. Oh, that is beautiful. Brother Ramsey, be of good cheer looks like. Oh, that is amazing. Hey, the rugby sisters, what does be of good cheer look like? Look at that. And that's how we should wake up in the morning. How many of you don't wake up being of good cheer? How many of you? I do not wake up being of good cheer. I know it's kind of creepy, but when your parents wake you up at, you know, six in the morning, you sit up and go, good morning, right? Big happy face, right? Kirsty, let me see. Be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. Oh, that is so cute, right? Be of good cheer. That's what we're after. It is a commandment. How many of you sometimes don't keep that commandment? Anybody? Caitlin, do you sometimes not keep the commandment to be of good cheer? Me too. Sometimes I have to repent of that. I look back across my day and I'm like, ooh, I don't know if I kept the commandment to be of good cheer. So how are we going to do that? How are we going to be of good cheer? Well, let's have a little youth conference scripture study here. 
All right. This is a scripture in the Book of Mormon. It's in Alma 62. No one ever reads it because it's the end of Alma. All right. Now, in Alma 62, this is a guy who's writing this verse. His name is Mormon. His name is not Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. His name is Mormon, and it's okay for us to call him Mormon because that is his name. All right, so Mormon is writing this. He says, because of the exceedingly great length of the war between the Nephites and the Lamanites, many had become hardened. Do you see that? Many had become hardened because of the great length of the war. He said, and many were softened because of their afflictions. Interesting. Many had become hardened. Many were softened. Insomuch they did humble themselves before God, even in the depth of humility. Look at the person next to you before they can ask you, say, you're a very spiritual person. What does that verse mean? Go ahead and ask them. You're a very spiritual person. What does that verse mean? If you're by yourself, ask the Holy Ghost. Say, you're a very spiritual person. What does that verse mean? All right. Ask your companion. You're a very spiritual person. What does that verse mean to you? Zach is obviously more spiritual than those two girls. So Zach, give them, oh, <laughs> I love the face. <gasps> what? What does that verse mean to you? Okay, I'm going to give you 30 seconds. I want to see you talking to each other or talking to yourself. What does that verse mean to you? Zoe's got a good answer. Oh, do we have an answer? Was it? I'm okay. You just said you just said a really good answer. I think you should say it home. Okay. <laughs> Can I just say I love your your accents? It's like being in Downton Abbey. I just love it so much. Can I move to you, please? Can I just move to you? Here's what I've learned. I've had students from uh, the UK. I've had students from the UK, and I've learned that Americans love accents. UK accent. They love them. Like every day, please let them pray. Please let them, right? It's like hearing, it's like hearing, you know, someone from Downton Abbey pray. You're like, please let them pray. I have also learned that people from the UK don't love American accents, which makes me mad. It should work the other way. You all should be like this. Oh, I love the way he says that. Oh, it's so cute. But none of you do. None of you do. All of you are like, nah, all the television shows, all the all the, all the movies are in that same ugly accent, right? Why can't you talk beautiful like us? Like, we're so beautiful. We're your homeland. I know. I get it. I get it. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. All right. Um, okay. So here's, um, I think if I were to ask any of you, you would say something like this. This verse tells me that when I go through something very difficult and long, I have a choice to make. Would someone say that? I have a choice to make. And it seems like the default choice, if you don't make a choice, what's going to be, what's probably going to happen? You're going to get hardened. How many of you have ever been hardened, angry person before in your life? Ever in your life, you've been hardened, angry person. I have too, because I think it's a defense mechanism. It's our way of saying, I'm tired of hurting. Anybody here been tired of hurting before? I'm just tired of hurting. So I'm just going to get hardened. I'll show you life. I won't feel, uh, right? Well, if you don't want to make that default choice, if you don't want to fall automatically into that, you have to choose to be softened. You have to choose to say, instead of saying, look at my two hands here. It's like saying, instead of saying, Lord, why me? Why now? It's Lord, what do you want me to learn? What do I need to learn from this? I, I want to be grateful for this experience. So please show me how, right? Do you see the difference between the two? And it's a deliberate choice. Can I say that again? It's a deliberate choice. You can't just go, well, I'm going to be softened. You have to do the things that softened people do in order to be softened. Does that make sense, Lauren? You have to do the things that softened people do in order to be softened. So here's what we're going to do. I'm talking too long, so I want to share one last story. Okay. Uh, now I think I'm going to have to fix my slides again because uh, I, I wasn't prepared. I know you guys are like typical American. Uh, I, I thought I was. I, I promise I thought I was. So here's what we're going to do. To finish, I want to tell you a story. Okay. I want to tell you a story 
And what I want you to do is, it's like a parable. I want you to hear the story, but I want you to think of what the, the meaning is for you. Everybody understand? Everybody with me? So again, it's a parable. So I'm going to tell you a story of a building and I want you to, I want you to just think, okay, the story itself is pretty good, uh, but I also want you to look for messages for you. Everybody nod if they get it. Everybody nod if they get it. Okay, Marissa, you got it? Okay, everybody with me? Okay. All right. So this is the Provo, Utah Tabernacle. It was built in, get this, 1886. It's one of the oldest buildings in Utah. I know in, in England, you guys are, you know, you're like 1886. We live in a house that old. I get it. I get it. But, but for Utah, this is a very old building, very old building. It was dedicated. Okay. The, dedic the dedication was done by John Taylor, the John Taylor, like the guy with a bullet in his leg from Carthage jail. Right. I mean, that's an old building, 1886. Everything was in black and white. Okay, so um, this was a meeting house for the church, forget this, uh, until 2010. So you were alive. They were still using this building as like to have state conference, to have firesides, to have concerts. That's 124 years. I don't know if you know this, but buildings don't last, usually last 124 years, church buildings. Like if we build a new chapel by in your neighborhood today, it's supposed to last maybe 50 years at the most, right? Um, this 124 years as a church building, absolutely amazing. But then in December of 2010, there was a massive fire. It was a fire. They left some uh, lighting equipment on that had a short in it. And uh, it completely destroyed a 124-year-old building. Now, again, uh, for us, it was a, you know, it's a very old building that means a lot because it, it's the pioneers, right? It's those old Utah pioneers who, who built this building. Okay, we're going to do something here. I want you to give this building thoughts and feelings. Okay, let's give this building thoughts and feelings. If it were to look around itself, what would it say? Ouch would be one, right? Ouch. Let's have it say a prayer. What would it say if you had it say a prayer? If it was me, I might say something like this, like, um, like why? Why? Has anyone ever said a prayer like this? I have tried my hardest to be good. I have done, I've tried my hardest to do what I've been asked to do. Why would you let this happen to me? What did I do wrong? I, do you know how many children have thrown up in me? Do you know how many boring speakers I have put up with? I have tried my hardest to do what you've asked me to do. And this is what I get in return. How many of you have ever looked around and thought there's other people that deserve this trial? Anybody else ever done this before where you're like, why didn't you hit them? They deserve it. They're bad. Like, why didn't you burn down the bank? Why didn't you burn down BYU's football stadium? They're terrible. Why didn't you... Why didn't you burn down, right? Why didn't you burn down the new skin bill? Why, why did you, why do this to me? I am the only one good. I'm the only one trying to do what's right. Why would you do this to me? Or maybe it feels worthless. Maybe it feels like, God, you don't love me and I'm worthless. I'm hollow inside. I don't, I don't feel good inside, right? Well, whatever this building might say, a lot of people in Utah uh, thought that they might, the church might tear it down because it was so old. They also thought that the church might sell the property. This is in downtown Provo, right in the corner of downtown Provo. So it's a pretty valuable piece of property. You could sell it for quite a bit of money. But in April of 2011, President Monson stood up and said, we would never let that building go. It means more to us than you can possibly imagine. I'm not talking about the building. Listen closely. President Monson said, that building means more to us than you can possibly imagine. We will never 
let that building go. Those of you, you, especially those of you who are a little bit younger, can I tell you something? You need to spend time, spend your time with the people who value you. Spend your time with the people who value you. And I hope and pray that you know that this church values you. We adore you. And you're like, "Ah, I'm not that great. I'm really not that valuable. No, to us, you are everything. We adore you, right? And even if you're burned out and hollow inside, right? And you feel like you're damaged. We love you. We'll take you. We think you're, we think the world of you, right, Sarah? I mean, we love you. We adore you. We'll take you. Well, President Monson said we would never get rid of that building because we love it. We're going to rebuild it. Now, um, they started on the cleanup um, of rebuilding the Provo Tabernacle. Does anybody here know? I bet it's okay if you don't. Um, It's not a gospel doctrine question, but does anybody here know the most difficult part of of rebuilding the Provo Tabernacle? It, yeah, Laura, I think you said it. I could kind of see your mouth move there. It was the foundation. The foundation of the building was 124 years old. It was a great foundation for 1886. For 2011, not so great. Um, it is, it's going to struggle. So they're going to have to replace the foundation. The problem is the only thing left of the building is sitting on top of the foundation. Well, they called a soil and foundation expert named Mike. He's a friend of mine. I know some of you are like, soil and foundation that's my dream job yeah so um he that's this is what he does for a living and he's very good at it they asked mike if he could replace the foundation without moving the building and mike said no (laughs) he said he said there's not a chance um he said that building's 124 years old structurally there's no way we could keep it up there and replace the foundation he said it's been done on buildings about half that size but definitely not that old He said, no, you cannot replace the foundation on that building without moving it. And he said they had a long meeting with Elder Uchtdorf and Elder Uchtdorf at the very end said, well, Mike, we believe in you. And he was, he's like, what? And they said, well, just look into it. Let's see if we can get it done. Um, I asked my friend, Mike, we were sitting at lunch and I said, how did you do it? And he said, just like this, he got really intense and he goes, very carefully. (laughs) I was like, He said, imagine this, imagine you have a dinner table set up for 20 people. It's got food on it and the drinks are all, the the glasses are all full of a drink. And someone says, please replace the table, but don't move anything. He's like, you have to go so slow and so carefully not to, you know, have the bricks crumble. Anyway, um, he said it was an absolute miracle because uh, 15 months later, They had the entire foundation replaced with a steel frame. If you don't know how big that building is, look at that truck. I mean, this is a big building. That's 6 million pounds of brick. And they are, they have completely replaced the foundation with a steel frame. Um, And he said, Hank, it was a miracle. He goes, I honestly, it was a miracle. He said, my firm, uh, his, his company won two awards for this. Uh, Big national awards because they had done something that, no one had ever really done before. Okay, you're not going to believe me. Laura, Gabby, Laura, you're not going to you're not going to believe me. Zach, you're not going to believe me. This is a true story. My friend Mike, Darren, listen to this. My friend Mike goes back to the church and uh and they were talking about the project and uh Elder Uchtdorf said to them, "It's time we talk about putting in a basement." And um Mike said he started laughing. He was like, oh, "That's funny." Right? Like and he said, Elder Uchtdorf kind of nodded at him and he said, you're serious. He's, he's like, he said, Elder Uchtdorf, um, with all due respect, sir, that will destroy the project. If we try to put a basement in, this building is all, we've already done the impossible. There's no possible way you could put in a basement. And he said, he said that they talked for a while and Elder Uchtdorf said, Mike, this building needs a basement um, and we believe in you. <laughs> And I said, I said, Mike, how'd you do it? Okay, this is one of my favorite part. He's like leaning in his chair at lunch and he goes, Hank, there's no YouTube video for this. There's nothing. If we're going to do this, we're going to be the first people ever 
to do this. There's no textbook. There's no things. There's nothing been written on this. We have to figure it out as we go. He said, we belong to the church of Jesus Christ of let's do impossible things of Latter-day Saints. Uh, because he said, this is going to be impossible. And I said, what happened? And he said, a miracle. He said, because two years later, we had the entire building 45 feet in the air. Um, he said, he said, I got calls from soil and foundation people from all over the world. They were passing these pictures around um, on the internet and email saying, look at what they're doing in Utah. And he said, people would call me and say, are those, is, is that real? Are you really doing this? And he's like, yeah, I know. He's like, come see it. Come fly to Utah. We'll give you a free book right? Like, come on out, come see this. Um, remember how I, I told you they won two awards for this? He said, we won 14 awards for this. Uh, he said, he said, could be because we had rewritten some of the laws in our industry, some of the foundational things we had, we'd been able to do something that no one thought was ever possible. Um, he said it was, he, he, he cried as he told me. He's, you know, I've never seen someone cry over soil and foundation, but he cried as he told me about the work that they did. Now, um, I got to tell you, here's our finished project. It was not the rebuilt Provo Tabernacle. It was the brand new Provo City Center Temple. Um, there's a temple now in downtown Provo where there used to be a tabernacle. Now, I want to put one of the first days of cleanup on the left next to the day of dedication on the right. Okay, now I'm gonna ask you a question. I want you to look at the picture on the left and remember the prayer that we said. Lord, why would you do this to me? Right, Lord, I've tried so hard to be good. And then look at the picture on the right. And let me ask a couple of questions. Do you think that building on the left had any idea what God had in store for it? What can you hear how would the Lord, knowing what's going to happen, seeing the picture on the right, what would he say to the building on the left? He might say something like, I know you're hurting. I know you're scared. I know you're frustrated. But what? Just hold on. Trust me. You're going to love what's coming. You've got to trust me. You're going to love how this ends up. Don't turn your back on me, right? The Provo Tabernacle can't get up and run down the street. I'm out of here, right? You got to stick with me here. Stay with me and you are going to love how this ends up. So please, I know you're hurting. I know you're suffering right now, but don't give up on me because I've got a future that you can't see, but I can. Oh, by the way, by the way, do you guys know that one painting survived the fire? One single painting survived the fire. Not even the whole thing, just that piece. That is the only painting that survived the fire. Coincidence? Probably, but it's a true story. And I love it. Um, what, is it what could be the message of this painting? I will never leave you. Even in the midst of any fire or difficulty you go through, even if you feel like I've left you, even if you feel like we're distant and we're far apart, I will not leave you. I will stay in the fire with you. And sometimes, let me see if I can say this right. Sometimes we don't see that he's been with us the whole time until long after. Did I say that again? Sometimes we don't see he's been with us the entire time until long after. And we look back and we realize he was with us the entire time. So I want to finish with a quote from the junior apostle Ulysses S. Soros, who said this. If I say it, it's no big deal because I'm just a guy from Utah. But if he says it, he's a special witness of Christ. And here's what he said. He said, trust in the merits and in the power of the atonement of Jesus Christ. I know sometimes we don't know what we can trust in, right? We don't know who we can trust in. Sometimes it feels like, can I trust in my friends? Can I trust in my leaders? Can I trust in, right? Who can I trust in? And he's telling you, trust in the merits and in the power of the atonement of Jesus Christ. Through his atoning sacrifice, you can gain the courage to win, even in the midst of your difficulties, your challenges, and your temptations. Trust in his love. And I leave that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm sorry if I went over my time, Sarah. Please don't be mad at me.
<laughs> Thank you so much. I don't care how long it took. That was too, it was worth sitting for hours and listening to every word of that. So can we do it again sometime, please? Can we do it again, please, sometime? Yes. Gabby, would you want to do it again? Hands up, who wants it again? Everyone, everyone. I need to come to England. I have never been, never in my entire life have I been to England. I've flown over it to go to Israel many times, but I've never been to England. I just want to so bad. Somebody, somebody find me somewhere to live. Right. <laughs> you can stay at our house. All right. Do you have room for seven of us? Uh, that crazy redhead, he might burn it down. I'm just telling you. <laughs> and it won't be an accident. It, it will be like he, he wanted to be in the newspaper or something. Sorry, sorry. I'll be quiet. <laughs> well, we'll find room for you. You have to come. Yeah. Okay. I will hand over to Zach and Laura for the um, question time. Can I stick around and watch? Well, uh, could you answer some? Oh, sure. <laughs> As I say, Hank, the, the questions are for you, so he might oh, they're be for me. To do. Oh, I didn't know they were for me. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. I was, absolutely. I didn't know the questions were for me. I thought they were for other people. I was going to just listen to learn. Okay. Laura, have you got the first one? Yes, absolutely. I, I was going to say I'm not answering the questions for this. Oh, list, this is all on you. Oh, I did. I thought you were answering the questions, Laura. Yes. I can't. Is does, who here knows Laura? Anyone here know Laura? This, is, this isn't my stake. Oh, I have a hard time telling if she's a youth or a leader. Uh, oh, that's so kind of you. <laughs> okay, so she's a, she's a leader uh, because yeah, because a youth would not say that. Okay, I I am not going to tell anybody my age on here because that is just no. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um. By the way, thank you so much. I really enjoyed that. And if you hadn't said the accent thing, I was going to say it. I'm just kidding. Right. Okay. So. <laughs> Um, I have a couple of questions to choose from. I'm going to go with a really funny one. Um, uh, how does Brother Smith deal with his child who wants to kill him? Oh, okay. Um, uh, he keeps me praying. Um, I, right? I, I don't think, I'm really grateful for him because I think if I just had the other four, I wouldn't pray very often. I'd be like, Lord, I'm a great father. Uh, this is really working out, right? Uh, but he's the one that keeps me praying. Do any of the parents here have one that keeps them praying? all the time, right? Yeah, I think maybe that's one of his purposes uh, is the Lord's like, you're going to keep him praying. Um, I try to be, I try to be patient. Uh, um, I felt like I was a really patient person and then I had kids uh, and uh, then I don't know what happened, but I feel, uh, I feel like my patience is getting better. Um, I, uh, I try to, and I think this is good for every family. I try to spend a lot of time with uh, right? Spend a lot of time with him doing what he likes. He likes some game called Animal Crossing. Have you guys played this? Animal Crossing? I do not understand what's happening. I, there is no point to this game. When I was a kid and you played a video game, there was a point. There is no point to this game. Um, we just fish. Uh, and then we go and talk to other people in the village. It's really quite strange. Uh, it's a different video game, but I, I talk to him about Animal Crossing and most of the time I don't know what he's talking about, but I, I really try. So thank you for the question. If you have any other ideas, please let me know um, because uh, I'm very afraid. All right. Hey, hi, Joe. First of all, that was awesome, by the way. Um, really nice to hear from you and it's oh. really good. Um, so the next question I've gone here is, um, what do you do if you're feeling a little low in spirit? Oh, that is such a good question. Okay, um, I have a long answer to this, but I'll try, I'll try to make it short. I have a long answer to every question. Okay, um, let's first talk about depression and anxiety. When I, you know, and I haven't seen the statistics in England, but I have seen the statistics in America, and I assume they're somewhat similar. Um, when I was in high school, it was the 1900s. Anybody here remember the 1900s? It was a great time to be alive, um, right? David O. McKay. All right. So um, the 1900s was a great time. And when I was in high school, uh, the rate of teenagers with mental illness was one out of 25. Okay. One out of 25. That's how, that's about 4%. So about four out of every hundred teenagers had some form of mental illness. In America, in 2020, guess what it is now? It is one out of three. One out of three. It was one of 25 when I was in high school. And in 25 years, it is now one out of three. Okay, so something is definitely happening. Um, so let's talk about that just briefly. 
uh, if, if you have three days of sadness, that's not depression. That's called life. Everybody has it. All right. It just happens. It's just part of our bodies. It's just part of being alive. But if your sadness is going on and on and on and you wake up sad and you go to bed sad and you don't know why, and it goes on for weeks and even into months, will you promise me right now, if you're a teenager or even an adult, that you'll talk to someone about this? Not if you'll talk to someone, if this happens to you. You have got to talk to someone about this um, because uh, it's happening to a lot of people. You are not the only one. It's happening to a lot of people and everybody's trying to figure out why. So you've got to talk to someone about this. Promise, Noah, promise. Even the missionaries promise you'll talk to someone about this. Don't keep it to yourself. Don't suffer in silence. Uh, and I will say this, mom and dad, what worked for us in the 1900s will not work for the teenagers today, right? Uh, Sarah, I don't know if you know if you remember the 1900s very much. You look younger than me, but um, for me, my dad would say, what you need is to get outside, do some work, and stop watching Saved by the Bell. That was what he told me to do, right? Uh, and so I, that's what I did, and it worked for us. That will not work for the kids of today. Um, something is happening. It's definitely different. Um, and I remember one old man came up to me once after I said that, and he said, I think they just need more hard work. And I said, well, I'd agree with you, but then we'd both be wrong uh, because he was wrong. It's not what they need. They need an adult who will listen to them. Um, so uh, teenagers, if you're feeling down and it's not going away uh, for, and you don't know why it's happening, then yeah, um, talk to an adult until you find one who listens to you. Okay, so let's say that's not happening to me. Happening to me. I just have a couple of days where I'm just feeling kind of down. Um, I wrote this book on happiness. It sold dozens of copies, mostly to my mom. Uh, but I found that the things that really help are really basic. Um, like who uses music to make themselves feel good? Who uses music to make themselves feel good? If you will use music every day to make yourself feel good, it will make a difference over a long period of time. Uh, same with who um, exercises to make themselves feel good. Anybody exercise to make themselves feel good, right? It's, it's a little thing that if you do every day, you don't have to run a marathon, all right? But just exercise every day, getting outside, walking. If you do it every day, it will, over time, it'll have a long effect. Who here gets enough sleep? Who here gets enough sleep? Who here doesn't get enough sleep? right? That has an effect on your happiness. I've noticed when I'm feeling down, if I look back over my week, I've probably had less sleep that week. Anybody noticed? I'm probably lacking sleep. Your brain needs sleep. So I'm a pretty practical guy. So I think about things like music, diet, exercise, um, sleep, uh, other things like if I'm feeling down, I usually have not been meditating and praying as much as I usually do. Uh, I have been too busy to do something like that. And so I stop and meditate and pray. Um, I've noticed that if I'm feeling down, I likely haven't had a lot of human connection, right? I haven't had those in-person conversations that you need to feel good, where you just talk with someone. How many of you ever just talked with someone for hours? Just talked with them for hours, right? And, and sometimes you go, you go to the restaurant uh, and you just talk and talk and talk and People come over and say, um, we're closing. And you're like, oh, have we been here that long? It's because our bodies love that type of connection where we get to talk and laugh. So Zach, for me, it's those little, little things instead of something grand that I haven't done. It's I've just noticed I've been slipping on the little things I'm supposed to be doing. And I try to get back to that. Okay, cool. My turn. Um, so this is actually a question that I had too. I watched um, a Roots talk that you did earlier, um, okay. on, like get ready for tonight. And it was amazing, by the way, absolutely loved it. So this question uh, is, have you had enough children or are you scared of having more twins? Oh, <laughs> oh um, you know, when I, and this really probably doesn't appeal to uh, those of you who are super young, but I didn't realize, um, you know, I always thought, okay, going on a mission, getting married, those are going to be huge decisions in my life, right? And I never looked to the decision of when to stop having kids. I bet the adults here can 
that one hit me hard. Like, I don't know when we're supposed to be done. Like I, I asked my wife, I said, should we just keep going till we have a girl? And she's like, that's a dangerous game, my friend. Uh, right. Like, um, you know, like when do you know that's going to be over? Uh, so no, we, yeah, we are definitely done having children. Um, uh, and we decided that five was where the Lord, um, was okay with us stopping. It was a hard decision. It really was, right? Because I don't want to leave a little Gabby up there waiting for us, like, Papa, why did you never have me, right? I was like, I'm sorry. Uh, so I had to really ponder and pray about it and think about it. But yeah, the next kid we have will be a goat. Uh, so, uh, or a grandkid. Anybody here a grandparent? I've heard it's the best thing ever. Is anybody here a grandparent? Do I have any grandparents here? Sister Cope, is it the best thing ever? I've heard it's the best thing ever. So I'll look forward to that one day. Oh, uh, David. David says it's the best thing ever, being a grandparent. All right. Do we have any more, Laura, Zach? Do I, I, I don't want to take up too much of my time. I'm happy to answer. I'm happy to stay all day, but I... <laughs> uh, a nice lighthearted one, I think, from my last one. Um, what job did you want to do when you were a child? Maybe a youth as well. Oh, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, I don't know. Um, I'm looking back going, I kind of just, I don't know if this is a good philosophy or not, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. I said my prayers every day and then I just moved forward taking advantage of opportunities that came, um, when they came, right? Uh, so I wasn't someone who was like, I want this specific job, this specific role. Like what I'm doing right now, I had no idea I would be doing. I had no clue I would be doing. If someone would have said, hey, in 10 years, you're going to be speaking over Zoom to people from Downton Abbey, right? I'd be like, what? Right? Um, I, would not have, I would not have known. I would not have known. So um, I take advantage of opportunities that come to me. And I pray every day that the Lord will guide me. Uh, so when I was younger, I, I think when I was, it was probably just before I went on a mission that I realized I want to do something like this. Um, I really like teenagers and you have to like teenagers to do this job. You can't just like teenagers when they act like adults. You have to like teenagers when they act like teenagers. And that's sometimes difficult for some adults to do. Some of them are like, I can't stand them. Ooh, I kind of did a little British accent there. Did you catch that? I was like, I can't stun them. Uh, no, Laura, it was good. It was good. Laura, you don't know British accents like I do. Uh, it was really good. It was really good. <laughs> Gabby, it was really good, huh? Huh, Gabby? Gabby, do not, do not. Yeah. Someone's going to say it was really good, and then I'm going to send you, like, gifts. So who said it was really good? All right. Oh, yes, JJ. JJ's like, it was really good. All right, JJ, send me your address. I will send you gifts. Okay. Um, so I, I, you have to like teenagers and I do, I enjoy the funny things they do, right? I enjoy, it's kind of like watching the discovery channel, the nature channel, right? It's like, Ooh, look at that one. That's a big one. Right. Uh, and they come over and they act like teenagers do. So, um, I really like teenagers and I love the gospel and this kind of works. Uh, so I knew I wanted to do something like that, but like I said, I prayed every day and then I just took advantage of the opportunities that came and kind of hopefully let the Lord guide me. All right, Laura, hit me. Okay. So this is actually kind of for me really selfishly. I'm so sorry, but I'm super interested. Um, you talked about struggles and struggles that we've all been having and we've all had different individual struggles since the beginning of this virus. I would really like to know how you and your family dealt with it and coped with it and how like how you've been if you've been doing the come follow me and how regularly you've huh? done it and just kind of how yeah okay um here's what i'll say first to that question especially to moms we have an ideal in our head of how things are supposed to go right how they're supposed to go in our head how they're supposed to look and the church does a great job of making a church video that kind of shows us the ideal right here's a perfect little family sitting around and they've all got their scriptures open and one of them's crying right and mom's holding up a picture and it's just perfect and we're like okay that's what it's supposed to look like and then you go try it and it looks nothing like the video right i mean nothing like the video and it's kind of like pinterest and what you do 
right? It's like they look nothing alike. And we, can, we have a tendency to get discouraged over that. And I have since realized that the ideal is nice, but it's rarely the real. And that's okay. The missionaries will understand this. I bet the missionaries had an idea in their head of what a mission was going to look like and how it was going to be. And then you get there and you're like, it looks nothing like what it was supposed to be in my head, right? But every once in a while, you have an ideal moment, right? You have one of those moments you're like, this is straight from a church video. Oh, and then you go back to the real. And that's really what family life is like, right? Every once in a while, you have a great moment. I remember once my son and I were fishing and we were talking about, you know, sin and temptation. He was saying great things and I was saying great things. And I was like, this is just like a church video. And then five minutes later, he went over and punched his brother in the face, right? And I was like, good feeling gone, uh, right? It just, uh, that, how could, why did that happen? So, So to everybody listening, first thing, there's the ideal. And that's okay to realize that there's an ideal that we're shooting for, but be okay with the real. So Laura, I, my thing with come follow me is my major goal is to have a positive experience. It's not so much to go get through a certain chapter or to cover this. uh, My major goal is to have a positive experience. And so that changes the way I go about it. Sometimes it's short because that's what we need to have a positive experience, right? It just needs to be short. Um, and if I was, if my goal was to get through a chapter or to get through content, do you see that it could turn into a negative experience? Um, and I would be trying to reach my goal of getting through content, getting through a chapter, getting through a lesson. So my goal is to have a positive experience. And when I keep that as my goal, that really works. You know, the first three weeks of the quarantine, um, we're really quite adventurous. We're like, ooh, this has never happened before. Whoa, this is crazy. Look at us doing, you know, or Kevin, you got to do your homework at home and uh, just called homework, um, right? And uh, you got to, you got And then about, I think it was somewhere around the second or third week that my kids got tired of it. Did this happen to anybody else? You're like, okay, I'm done. Like, let's go back to normal life, especially missionaries. Oh, missionaries, you know, they're like, you got to stay in your apartment. For how long? A week? I don't think I could stay in my apartment an entire week. A week is nothing now, right? Looking back, a week is nothing staying in your apartment. I've got missionaries who I've talked to in Italy who've been in their apartment for over a hundred days. Um, uh, they just, uh, it, it's, you know, it's, it's a completely different reality. So when we started dealing with that, that's when we had to get a little bit creative. Um, because remember, what's our goal? have a positive experience, not necessarily to have certain things done, but our goal is to have a positive experience. So what we do is uh, we make necessary adjustments to reach our goal. Uh, So sometimes that meant we weren't going to do school that day because it was not going to be a positive experience, (laughs) right? For anybody. Um, There were tears over seventh grade math. I mean, just tears. And I finally stopped crying. Uh, and said, let's just stop for now, right? Because I just couldn't handle it. So um, Gabby's like, wait, what? Uh, Okay. Um, So um, I I hope that helps, Laura, is the idea is every day, let's wake up and say, okay, I want to have a positive day today. Now that does mean sometimes I've got to work on things I don't want to work on. That doesn't mean I have to have a negative day, but it does mean I probably ought to make some adjustments, especially for little, little ones, to make sure they're having a positive experience as well. Um, And sometimes we worry as parents, if my kid does not know, understand this particular lesson, they're probably going to turn into a serial killer. And that's not true. Um, They're probably going to turn out to be a great kid uh, if you don't get through that chapter. Uh, And they're going to be a great adult if you don't get through that chapter. So you can kind of ease off the gas pedal a little bit. Does that help a little? Help a little bit? I love this group. I can't tell you. I just love this group. So the other day, I talked to a group in Wales, and I learned very quickly that Wales is not England, by the way. I mean, quickly. Because I was like, hello, my friends in England. And they're all like, Wales. (laughs) I'm like, whoa. Okay. Wish I could speak whale. Uh, I mean, it was was wild. Um, But I, as I've talked to the group in Wales and now to this group, I just feel like, I don't know, maybe it's just me being dumb, but I just feel a close affinity. So I've told my wife, 
um, probably in 2022, I want to come out for like, like six weeks. And I want to just, if, if anybody will have me, I just want to go around and see everything and talk to everyone. And so, um, so let's plan on that. Cause I just, I don't know. I feel like it's, I don't know. It, it's my, it's where my ancestors are from. So maybe that's why, I don't know. I just feel like I want to go home. Brother Smith, thank you very much. Laura, Zach, thank you for the questions. I really, really enjoyed tonight. Thank you so much. Uh, I have loved it, Brother Piper. Really, I've loved it. it. So thank you again very much. Uh, I believe we're going to have a closing prayer by Gabby now. Uh, and uh, again, thank you for, for, for everyone who's joined tonight. Uh, and again, Brother Smith, thank you for, for, for speaking to us. It's been great. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that we could be together tonight and hear wonderful happy things and we're grateful that we can all have joy in the spirit in our lives and please bless that we continue to have that and please bless that we all move forward and make improvements step by step and please bless that we go away feeling happy and we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ amen